Was there a cue to get I guess quiet? so, yeah. Well, I guess it's gotten quiet, so we'll, we'll get started. Uh, <laughs> my name is Tom Geiler, uh, the president of the Communal Studies Association. Um, and welcome to our first plenary of the conference, uh, the development of developmental communalism. Uh, before we get started, a few brief announcements. Uh, the first is that just outside this um, lovely uh, theater is a book display by uh, Tim Miller. Uh, there's some really good treasures there. We all ask that every book, for every book you may want to take home and give a new home, uh, you donate a dollar, which goes to the CSA to put on events like this. Um, the second announcement is that uh, for those of you who may be new, um, every uh, the first, um, the second dinner is always our annual auction uh, with all kinds of interesting goodies that you can take home and support the CSA with. If you have auction items, please see Kathy Fernandez. Um, who is right here in the front row, uh, or down at the registration desk to drop those off. We just ask you to fill out a brief form telling us what you have, um, and that'll be uh, conducted tonight uh, at dinner. Um, finally, um, for those of you uh, who may not have uh, known last night, uh, the hospitality room uh, where there's food and drinks and uh, beer and wine and things like that for after the conference will be held after dinner tonight in room 300 in uh, Rose Bank, <coughs> Rose Bank East, 300 Rose Bank East. Um, if you are finding, having trouble finding it, just follow follow the people looking for beer later tonight. Yeah. Is anyone hearing in here? We do have some uh, microphones that are plugged in. Is anyone hearing in here? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, All right. I will, uh, the way this will work is I will introduce each speaker as they present their papers. Um, everyone will present their papers, then we'll have a question and answer session discussion uh, following that. Um, I have to introduce a man who needs no introduction here, and yet here we are, and I'm going to do it anyway. Um, Don Pitzer is the Distinguished Professor Emeritus of History and Founder and Director Emeritus of the Center for Communal Studies at the University of Southern Indiana. He's a founding member and first president of the Communal Studies Association and International Communal Studies Association. He edited a book titled America's Communal Utopias with his own and 16 other communal scholars' essays on historic communal groups that has been used as a textbook. <laughs> yeah, we're going to do ads too. Yeah. Um, his research on the Harmonists and Owenite movements is summarized in his book, New Harmony, Then and Now, which includes the color photographs of Daryl Jones. Don, take it away. <coughs> I've titled my uh, presentation, The Development of Developmental Communalism. For Christmas 2021, I received a gift subscription to the online site StoryWorth. During 2022, I wrote a series of essays that were bound into an informal autobiography, which I titled, Doors Opened, I walked through. The title was never more appropriate than in my journey through the field of communal studies. Wonderful people opened their doors and hearts along the way. I began to perceive a pattern in communal history and posited a theory which I called developmental communalism. Now, however, more and more concepts and organizations are known by simple acronyms that make them easier to remember. <laughs> uh, yes, we are at the CSA conference. So for the final chapter title in my autobiography, I gave developmental communalism an upgrade. Uh, I called it in today's lingo, DEVCOM. <laughs> The foundation of developmental communalism began in 1974 and eventually rested on a framework of four assumptions that help explain why some communal groups thrive over long periods of time and others soon terminate. First, living communally is a social arrangement available to any group of people. Second, the communal method is usually adopted in an early stage as crisis, uh, in an early stage or crisis, 
because of its promises of security, solidarity, and survival. Third, as an organizational structure, communal living is a regulated lifestyle intentionally created and maintained. And fourth, the first importance, excuse me, uh, the most important for the theory of developmental communalism, that structure and lifestyle must be adjusted over time or even abandoned altogether to meet the challenges and opportunities of new realities, or the movement itself will face disillusionment, decline, and demise. Years before I realized it, the evidence of developmental communalism and the threat it posed to intentional communities stared me in the face. Eventually, I had two Eureka moments in places more than 6,000 miles apart at Amana, Iowa, and Kibbutzim in Israel. In a meeting in Amana, I made the naive remark that its founding inspirationist movement had ended with the so-called Great Change in 1932. I was referring to the fact that after a decade in which fire destroyed, uh, destroyed their flour and woolen mills, the Great Depression undermined their economy, and radios, automobiles, and the yearning for college education captured the imagination of their young people, Amana members voted to abandon communal organization for private ownership. Madeline Romig, now Madeline Bendorf, and still a dear friend, came to me afterwards and kindly but firmly told me, we still practice our religious faith. We still live in our communities. Right before my eyes was the reality of a religious movement that had adopted communal living, used it successfully for a century, then proved itself vital and adaptive enough to embrace a process of change into another organizational structure. Amana's inspirationism lives today, and its communal neighborliness thrives in its seven villages, along with private property and private enterprise. After being in Amana, I visited friends in Israel during the 1980s and observed their Jewish communes called kibbutzim. More than 260 egalitarian kibbutz communities had been established by the Zionist and socialist movements in mostly Arab Palestine as a method of settlement that eventually created the Jewish nation of Israel in uh, 1948. There, I witnessed religiously innovative socialistic communes in various stages of adjustment in a difficult period of transition. What future relevance did these communes have? Private and government funding had become minimal and increasing numbers of the rising generation were not signing up for lifetime membership. Some kibbutzim were already revising or abandoning home established, long established traditions. Children were living with parents instead of in separate quarters. Families were eating together rather than in central cafeterias. And from my viewpoint, the very existence of the communal system was in peril. When I presented this evidence as part of my evolving theory of developmental communalism at the 1988 meeting of the International Communal Studies Association in Scotland, loyal kibbutzniks in the audience were quick to react, 
Three of their founding fathers, including Shimon Mahler, came to me afterward. They could not believe that this theory would apply to the communities they loved. My heart was touched, and I could only thank them for their candor and say that I would continue to revise my theory in the light of communal realities. Seven years later, <laughs> while I was walking with Shimon through the streets of his own kibbutz, he privately confided, and I quote, I have observed the developmental changes taking place here that your theory suggests. <laughs> In this poignant moment, we shared the hope that making adjustments would preserve his and other kibbutzim with their best features intact. In September of, 19, of 2017, I received an email announcement which assured me that our hopes had not been in vain. As Israel celebrated the 70th anniversary of its independence, in 2018, the kibbutzim planned to commemorate their vital role. In recognizing the developmental adaptive process that had ensured the survival of most kibbutzim, the notice read, and I quote, in some ways, while the modern kibbutz would be unrecognizable from the early days, the fundamental principles of the movement, however, remain unchanged. Communal living, solidarity, and cooperation. Perhaps ironically, perhaps prophetically, one of the clearest examples of developmental communalism and its consequences was literally close to my home when I joined the history faculty at what is now the University of Southern Indiana uh, in 1967. I already knew that New Harmony of Harmonist and Owenite fame was only 30 miles away. As the site for two historic communal efforts, the first religious, the second secular, New Harmony presented a perfect combination for me to apply my theory. I discovered that most current local residents had already branded the harmonists an unqualified success and the Owenites a colossal failure. If you saw the hardworking harmonist only through the lens of their building three towns, producing great wealth in agriculture, light manufacturing, and commerce, and by investments in oil wells, pipelines, and railroads, they were obviously successful. If you considered the Owenites 30 communities in the United States and several other countries as short-lived experiments using com the communal method of reform, you might count them failures. Yet, communitarian Owenite activists like son Robert Dale Owen and feminist Fan Francis Wright and uh, uh, um, decided to use other methods, teaching, public lectures, publications, trade unions, consumer producer cooperatives, and office holding to support emancipation, laborers and women's rights, planned parenthood, and tax-supported public schools, museums, and libraries, including the founding of the Smithsonian Institution. How can a movement involved with these initiatives be considered a failure? My mentor and groundbreaking communal historian, Arthur Bester Jr., 
wrote in the 1970 edition of his book, Backwoods Utopias. And this is a quote. Owen's practical project at New Harmony, Indiana, ended in failure, but his propagandist mission to America did not. It succeeded in converting communitarian socialism from an esoteric movement confined to certain obscure religious sects into a publicly discussed theory of social reform, which competed on equal terms for a quarter of a century at least with rival programs for curing the ills of American society." End of quote. As for the Harmony Society, Prophet George Rapp became, an ob became so obstinate in enforcing Christian communism and in the perfectionism of celibacy that he set the course for his movement to fossilize and die after a century in 1905. For all its economic and cultural achievements, the harmonist movement ceased to exist. Adaptability is the key to the viability of a movement. And adaptability is the key for me as I have derived great satisfaction from watching others use the theory of developmental communalism as a springboard for additional interpretations. Josh Lockyer uses his concept of transformative utopianism. Dan McCannon perceives creative symbiosis and Greg Brown applies a developmental approach to the field of communal studies itself. And I'm honored to be uh, included in this uh, group of scholars and to call them not only colleagues, my, but my friends, and to be on this panel today. Next, we have Josh Lockyer, who's the professor of anthropology at Arkansas Tech University. He's been working with and studying contemporary intentional communities, CeeLo, Earth Haven, Eco Village, and Dancing Rabbit Eco Village, most prominently <clears throat> for almost 25 years. He was lead editor of the volume Environmental Anthropology, Engaging in Eco Ecotopia, uh, Bioregionalism, and Permaculture, and Eco Villages, and author of Seeing Like a Commons 80 Years of Intentional Community Building and Common Stewardship in Silo, North Carolina, uh, which is available downstairs if you're interested. Josh will even sign it for free. Uh, the latter was the recipient of the CSA Outstanding Book Award in 2021. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Don. I'm going to try and go without a mic and just project my voice. Can you all hear me in the back? Good. Thank you. I am honored to be here and to be part of this panel uh, at the 50th Annual CSA Conference. And I think it's my I started coming in 2004, and I think it's my 17th in the last 20 years or so. Um, and I'm not really, I don't really want to delve into the specifics of my idea of transformative utopianism, but more just reflect on how I have used Don's ideas and used them to analyze and interpret some of the communities I've worked with. I came to communal studies as a young anthropology graduate student. And I was drawn to anthropology because of the way it highlighted the value of diverse ways of being human, ways that often involve some sort of local scale communal living, living that is often compared to the context in which I grew up more in balance with nature. Anthropology is also pointed directly to the injustices and unsustainabilities of global industrial capitalist colonialism, a force that so often actively destroyed those diverse communal ways of being humans, and a force that inspired so many efforts to build communal societies, including right here at New Harmony. I meant to go here. To a, a young anthropologist, early ethnographies of indigenous societies 
seemed to offer what to my young, naive mind at the time seemed like a utopian alternative <coughs> to an unsustainable society I saw around me. Albeit an alternative that, as many anthropologists pointed out, um, that across cultural boundaries wasn't really possible here at the moment. So I entered grad school with this question. Who was building something approaching a transcendent alternative from within our own cultural context? Not very aware of intentional communities yet. In the winter of 1999 through 2000, and under the guidance of an old family friend to whom I posed that very question I just stated, I stumbled into CELO community as a dissertation research topic. Here is a group of people who had spent several generations building a communal alternative here at home. As I dove into studying CELO ethnographically, I was drawn, drawn to communal studies because it offered a nurturing context in which to forge my research, and because my advisors in graduate school were so skeptical about my choice of topic. <laughs> communal studies pointed me to the work of anthropologists amongst us today, Susan Love Brown, John Andelson, Heather Van Wormer, who had taken intentional communities quite seriously as places to study, as realms of active and effective cultural construction and cultural critique. And communal studies offered Don Pitzer's theory of developmental communalism as a tool I could use to not only justify the ethnographic study of contemporary intentional communities, but to make sense of the meaning, significance, and developmental trajectory of CELO community in the wake of a previous ethnographer's evaluation of it as a utopian failure. Don encouraged all of us, communal studies scholars and beyond, to move past our tendency to evaluate intentional communities based on the criterion of enduring communalism itself. He demonstrated that for the causes taken up by communal groups to survive and expand, a movement beyond a strictly communal phase was sometimes necessary, and that the causes and communities often lived on in other ways, even after, after their communal phases ended. Don's theory helped me to recover and recontextualize the often maligned concept of utopia as I sought to make sense of how CELO community had had an impact beyond its own borders. Don's work helped me recognize that though there likely is no utopia, the power of utopian striving for a more just and sustainable world often stretches its impact beyond the individual communal societies where utopian visions are dreamt pursued. It drove home the point that the communities we study, far from being the isolated eccentricities they are often portrayed as, are often more interconnected with each other and with the broader societies in which they exist than at first is apparent. It gave me hope that even a CELO may have fallen short of the vision of its original founder, other communities have found in it lessons and inspiration for continuing the utopian pursuit. But now, 20 odd years later, after I started this endeavor, it seems to me like what I hoped would happen, a utopian project of communal living spreading is not really gaining ground, even as as Don Jansen has been fond of pointing out to us recently, there is an ever-broadening interest in something called intentional community. <laughs> Dystopian outcomes of individualist, industrial, capitalist, economic development manifest themselves more and more every day in the form of, say, for example, human-induced climate change and political corruption. Making the lessons of utopian communalism all the more relevant. It seems to me it's time for, I'm not sure what the right word is, scaling up or scaling out of lessons from utopian communalism 
in a time that demands some fundamental sociocultural and political economic transformations if greater justice and sustainability are to be achieved. I still believe in that initial insight that drew me to CELO, Earth Haven Eco Village, Dancing Rabbit Eco Village, and other communal groups. Here are groups of people working from within the belly of the beast to try to create a different model to live by, characterized by different systems and values and practices. This is directly relevant to the challenges we face in the world today. I'd like to start moving towards a conclusion by perhaps speculating about the future of the CSA in this challenged world and drawing on the work of Rebecca Solnit. In her book, A Paradise Built in Hell, Solnit makes three important points. First, she reminds us of the ways in which community emerges in times of crisis, such as those that follow natural disasters. She demonstrates that such communities are too often temporary, replaced by a reimposition of the old order that reigned before and perhaps even helped precipitate disaster. Times of disaster, while clearly undesirable, tragic, represent opportunities for remaking the social order and building stronger communities. As I look around the world, I see the number and extent of crises around the world grow, and opportunities for shifting the old order emerge, building enduring communities seems likely to be an essential strategy for survival and hopefully thriving. Indeed, it is a way that humans have so often lived throughout our long history and around the world. And in this context, I think the CSA has something to offer. And I suspect this won't be everyone's cup of tea, and that's okay. But I'd love to see the CSA, at least in part, take a more explicitly applied approach to what we do with our collective knowledge of the past and of present of experiments in intentional community. We can certainly offer plenty of cautionary tales about what not to do. <laughs> the modern history of communalism is littered with its share of tragedies, disasters, and otherwise, <clears throat> one could say, failed attempts to build enduring communities, but it was one of Don Pitzer's insights that even in those cases, there is significance and insight about how people can cooperate and work towards shared goals, whatever those might be. And beyond that, not all communal societies end in dissolution or disaster, certainly. If you spent time with my book about the 80-year-old CELO community, you know I believe there are some real lessons in that 80 plus year history. Lessons embodied in Eleanor Ostrom's Commons Design Principles. Lessons for successful, sustainable, and egalitarian communal governance. I think my fellow panelists all, as well as many of my colleagues in the audience, in their daily life and work, embody this drive to apply insights from our field of study to helping people who are working to solve problems and build positive social transformation. As I look to the future of the CSA and to its developmental and potentially transformative trajectory, as I look to a world that seems hungry for and in need of community, I'd like to see us continue build on the efforts we've already made to apply our insights to a world in need, what does this look like? Well, I think of a couple of recent publishing projects I've taken on uh, with colleagues from five different countries around the world who study A, eco-communities, and B, urban design. We, we try to distill five lessons from the history of eco-communities 
that we could share with urban planners to consider as they try and build more sustainable cities. Uh, I think a piece I am working on finalizing with Zach Rubin, where we uh, <laughs> we've tried to point to ways that eco villages and other eco communities could be even more successful at their attempts to address human induced climate change. What else could we offer? I mean, I already mentioned cautionary tales, uh, and I can think of a few lessons we can offer there. Things like, well, let's be cautious about charismatic leadership and the forms of indoctrination and isolation that bind people to narcissistic leaders. Don't insist on a strict maintenance of a communal order. Right? Be flexible. Don't proceed without some kind of process and structure for bringing people together uh, and allowing them to work together. So cautionary tales. Stories of what works. Right? This can also be grounded in the theory of developmental communalism, uh, recognizing that things might change, but guiding them in effective ways. Many of us know something about what contributed to the resilience of communal groups. Groups that often arise in periods of dynamic change, such as the one we're living in now, are there lessons that can be applied beyond those individual contexts? Again, I flatter myself in thinking that Ostrom's design principles for the commons are relevant here, too. Would further study find that such principles are present in successful communal groups, whatever those groups are? Can we guide and encourage others building communities to keep those principles in mind? Perhaps all of this might be translated to some sort of toolkit for community building, and an outreach or consulting arm of the association. I guess my point is that the current situation is too urgent to not be more deliberate in offering our hard won knowledge to a world in need. Doing so seems to be an extension of the direction Don Pitzer has always been pointing us. Thank you, Josh. We have, next is Dan McCannon, who is the Emerson Senior Lecturer at Harvard Divinity School, where he has taught, taught since 2008. He's the author, most recently, of Camp Hill in the Future, Spirituality and Disability in an Evolving Communal Movement, and several other books on intentional community, environmentalism, and the religious left. Dan is co-chair of the International Communal Studies Association. Hi, everybody. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much uh, for getting up bright and early. And it's such an honor to be um, at joining these others in honoring all of the lessons that we have learned as a movement, as a, as a society uh, from Don Pitzer over the years. Uh, what I will do in my remarks is three things. First, I will try to explain from my own perception uh, what Don Pitzer's theory of developmental communalism is all about. Second, I will describe my own contribution to the development of this theory. And third, I will try to illustrate uh, that contribution and some of uh, the other ideas we've heard by retelling the history of Roman Catholic monasticism. So I have 20 minutes, two millennia. Okay, first, uh, what is developmental communalism? As I see it, it is first of all the claim that all communes and intentional communities develop over time 
and that we can't understand them unless we attend equally to all developmental stages without assuming that the most original or most communal stage of a movement is somehow worthy of outsized attention. And second, it's the claim that most or all communal groups are situated within larger developmental trajectories. They are often expressions of broader movements that take communal form for only part of their history, and thus can best be understood in relation to the broader history of all the other things that this larger movement is engaged in. So what have I added? In my book, Camp Hill in the Future, I study an intentional community movement that is nearly a century old with a core question. How do intentional communities evolve when they have lived for three generations or more? To answer that question, I describe three distinct developmental pathways that can be taken by communal groups. Pathways that I call self-enclosed societies, evolving beyond community, and creative symbiosis. I don't necessarily claim that these are the only possible pathways. I'd be really curious to know if any of you, based on your lived experience or your scholarship, I uh, think there are other pathways that some communities have taken that are distinctly different from these three. There is an important presupposition underlying my description of the three pathways. That presupposition is that the initial phase of any communal group is inherently unstable. And the reason that it's unstable is that in the early years, communal groups typically expect individual members to sacrifice important individual life goals for the sake of bringing the community into the world. Now, I think there are some recent communal movements, especially co-housing, that try to skip over uh, this initial phase of self-sacrifice for the benefit of the community. And it'll be interesting to see how their ongoing pathways might change what I'm presenting here. But for many communal groups, in the initial phase, individuals put themselves second to the needs of the group itself. And there are a variety of reasons uh, why they might be willing to do this. Uh, in some cases, it's because of the narcissistic leaders that uh, Josh just alluded to. But in other cases, it's simply because it's really thrilling to bring something entirely new into the world. Uh, people are willing to uh, give up a lot in order to see a, a utopian vision come into fruition. And for some kibbutzniks and camp pillars, an additional uh, reason uh, uh, to be willing to do this is that they were refugees from unspeakable violence. Uh, uh, so this is kind of what, um, what Don was alluding to, the particular characteristics of early phases or crisis phases. These characteristics allow individuals to engage in a kind of self-sacrifice that is not easy to maintain over the long term of the individual's life and is extremely difficult to maintain over multiple generations. For this reason, I assume that with each passing generation, and sometimes with each passing year within a generation, a communal society must become more internally complex in order to allow individuals to achieve the full range of ordinary life goals. Rudolf Steiner, a spiritual teacher who is especially important for the Camp Hill movement, articulated this principle in his so-called sociological law. Speaking of all human groups, not just communal ones, Steiner observed that there is an inevitable shift of emphasis from the group to the individual. Initially, the individual serves the group. Later, the group serves the individual. Now, you may not agree with Rudolf Steiner about this. You may not agree with me in my use of this. In fact, 
at least one contemporary communal group, the Bruderhof, takes the rejection of this idea as one of its foundational principles, at least if I understand the Bruderhof correctly. Bruderhof believed that it is always possible for the individual to put the needs of others ahead of their own, and that this practice is, in fact, the secret to happiness. For this reason, the future evolution of the Bruderhof will be an especially interesting test of the ideas that I'm developing here. In any case, each of the three developmental trajectories that I describe represents a distinct way in which communities achieve a common goal, which is allowing individual members to pursue the ordinary range of individual life goals. <clears throat> First path, self-enclosed societies. Some communities are able to grow so large um, that they can have their kind of own internal diversity in which individuals can find various roles within the life of the community uh, that allow them to achieve their ordinary goals. Uh, and the Hutterites are a great example of this. And I like this picture of young Hutterite people uh, because they are all running in the same direction. Uh, uh, but just looking at the smiles on their faces, I get the sense that each of them is maybe smiling for a slightly different reason. And they're also finding their own uh, pathway. Maybe that's just what I'm projecting. <coughs> Second developmental trajectory is what I call evolving beyond community. Uh, so as a community shares its distinct wisdom and values with the larger society, the boundary between community and society breaks down uh, and, uh, and particular practices such as sharing property uh, and so forth uh, become less necessary. Uh, so this is certainly what's happened here in New Harmony uh, with the um, dispersal of ONI values and harmonious values in the surrounding community. It's what's happened in the kibbutz movement with the development of the so-called reform kibbutzim, uh, the reality today uh, that most of the people who spend their days working at a kibbutz are not actually kibbutz members uh, and so forth. Uh, uh, I think it may be the, uh, the developmental trajectory that Don assumes as normative, uh, but I'm curious for more conversation with you, Don, about that. Third path is what I call creative symbiosis. And this is what happens when uh, a community is able to present its core values to its neighbors to such a degree that the neighbors find it valuable to them for the community to remain communal. Uh, uh, so basically, it's when a community gets its neighbors invested in its own distinct survival, uh, persuades members of ordinary society that it's a good thing when there are some people who are not living according to the values of ordinary society. And this takes some of the burden off of the members of the community to sustain their way of life, allowing them more chances for individual development. Uh, so if you think about the phase of the Shaker movement when they were heavily involved in adopting children from the larger society, that would be a small example of creative symbiosis that worked for a time for Shakers and then stopped working. Uh, likewise, uh, in the early years of the Kibbutz movement, they had a very strong symbiotic relationship with the State of Israel and particularly with the Labor Party. Uh, in Israel uh, that caused people who were not kibbutzniks to be invested in the survival of kibbutzim. And of course, that uh, had, um, was disrupted to a significant measure as political power in Israel shifted from labor to labor. I came up with the idea of creative symbiosis uh, the day after our 2017 conference at Zor, uh, while I was hiking at the Cuyahoga Valley National Park, which is a good place to go if you're heading back to the airport from Zor. 
I was thinking about Christian monasticism, I think, because we so rarely think about Christian monasticism at the Communal Studies Association. And it occurred to me that the main thing that Camp Hill had in common with Christian monasticism is that in both cases, there is this symbiotic relationship between the community and a larger society that thinks it's valuable for that community to exist. Uh, and in fact, when we retrace the whole history of Christian monasticism, we can see lots of examples of creative symbiosis, as well as a few examples of other developmental trajectories. And so I thought today, instead of telling you about how I would apply these theories to Camp Hill, which you can read about in my book, uh, I would talk about how they might apply to the monastic tradition that really should be much more a part of our thinking and theorizing as communal studies scholars. Uh, in a sense, the origins of Christian monasticism can be traced to the process by which Christianity as a whole evolved beyond community. According to the Book of Acts, and Bible scholars uh, have different views about how much we can trust the Book of Acts on this point, but according to the Book of Acts, the early church, Christianity as a whole, held all property in common. As most Christians drifted away from this practice in order to missionize ever larger uh, communities of new converts, small groups retained it, especially households composed of widows and virgins, which is to say celibate women who often played important leadership roles uh, in the early church. Equally important, Christians never forgot the communal ideals of their predecessors. The passage from Acts was part of scripture, so it was available for every subsequent generation to reclaim, or perhaps to feel guilty about having failed uh, to reclaim. And that, I think, suggests a really important principle. Whenever a community, whenever a movement evolves beyond community, it leaves open a door for what Josh has called transformative utopianism, the tendency for new communal groups to model themselves on the communities of the past. By around the third century, this was happening among the so-called desert monks of Egypt, who abandoned the cities for a life of prayer and community. And it was happening in the cities and agricultural countryside, where monastic communities often formed around the households of especially pious women, such as St. Macrina in Cappadocia, the person in the middle of this picture with her brothers, and uh, Marcella in Rome. These kinds of activities set the stage for the first really important case of creative symbiosis. Even though the monastics had rejected the values of the cities, Christians in the cities craved the spiritual death of the monks. Lay people would travel to the desert to visit the monks, and soon enough they began recruiting them, sometimes kidnapping them, uh, to come back to the cities and serve as bishops. And this is actually the origin of a celibate clergy in Catholicism. Early Christian leaders weren't necessarily celibate, but celibacy became the norm because Christians found particular value uh, in uh, the wisdom that monks brought, not only from their celibate practice, but from their life in community. Christian monasticism also influenced the rise of Islam. If you think about the five pillars of Islam, especially the practice of praying five times a day and the practice of almsgiving, you can see that what Muhammad did was to take some characteristic monastic practices and simplify them so that they could become the universal norm for all people. I'm not sure whether this is best described as the developmental trajectory of evolving beyond community or of creating a self-enclosed society, but it's definitely something that I think fits within this story. Meanwhile, in Western Europe, Monasticism developed several important symbioses with the larger society. 
In some places, noble families encouraged their younger children to join monasteries to avoid having to divide their estates. In others, monasteries served as the political structures, with abbots taking the place of feudal lords. Monasteries also famously preserved much of the intellectual heritage of the ancient world. By around the 12th century, the time was ripe for another round of transformative utopianism, as some Christians sensed a disconnect between wealthy monasteries and the ideals found in the Book of Acts. The result was the ideal of apostolic poverty. For traditional monastic orders, poverty simply meant communalism. As long as you hold property in common, you can have as much property as you want. Uh, the new apostolic idea, promoted by people like Peter Waldo and Francis of Assisi, was that wealth should be owned collectively and kept to the minimum needed for survival. Now, after this idea got out there, some branches of the apostolic poverty movement followed the self-enclosed society path, rejecting the mainstream church and insisting that all Christians adopt the ideal of poverty. This was the case for the Waldensians and Cathars, both persecuted as heritage, her heretics, but the Waldensians are still alive, uh, still around in Italy, and the Cathars continue uh, to be an important uh, factor in some later instances of transformative utopianism. St. Francis, for his part, made peace with the Pope and thus brought about a different form of creative symbiosis. Franciscans, along with other mendicant orders, began playing many different roles in the larger society, uh, serving as teachers, serving as preachers, serving as missionaries, laying the foundations for the emergence of the medieval university, and sometimes even uh, serving as heretic hunters <laughs> against the apostolic poverty promoters who had followed the path of self-enclosed society. At this point, I'd like to take a step back and notice that the entire history of monasticism involves an oscillation between periods of reform in which monastics strive to emulate the ideals of the early church, and periods of laxity in which monastic rules are simplified to accommodate the individual needs of the monks. Most monastic historians assume that the really important story is the story of reform. But from the perspective of developmental communalism, this is something I think we could bring uh, to our friends in monastic studies, it's just as important to trace the history of monastic laxity. My guess is that monks typically relaxed the rules not because they were lazy or bad monks, but because they were attentive to the genuine needs of individual monks and the needs of their non-monastic neighbors. By connecting those two sets of needs, they were engaged in creative symbiosis. I'll now fast forward to two more recent examples of creative symbiosis. For the first 10 years of my teaching career, I taught at St. John's University and the College of St. Benedict. These colleges, one for men and one for women, were founded by German Benedictines in the 19th century. At the time, Minnesota was just being settled uh, by white immigrants, and the Benedictines may have thought of it as a wilderness, but they weren't like the desert monks there to escape from civilization. They were there because German Catholic lay people were also there. Uh, the monks intended to serve those lay people as parish priests. The sisters intended to serve them as nurses and hospital administrators and parish school teachers. Both groups served them by creating the colleges where I wound up teaching. With all these jobs, not all of them lived in community in the traditional way. But those who did live in the monastery provided an important anchor for the rest and for the lay people, especially the college students, who shared the domain of those monasteries. Today, most monastic communities in the West are experiencing significant numerical decline. But interest in monasticism among lay people is as strong as ever. Just as Joshua was saying, interest in intentional community 
is as strong as ever, even if the communities aren't always strong. The religious orders have responded by creating so-called oblate programs, in which lay people affiliate with the monastery, which hosts them for retreats, and helps them incorporate aspects of monastic life into their own daily rhythms. For the moment, these programs epitomize creative symbiosis, as they provide monasteries with a new community of enthusiastic supporters. It's possible, though, that the numbers of real monastics will continue to shrink, while the numbers of oblates will continue to increase, to the point that oblates are all that's left. In that case, creative symbiosis will have given way to evolving beyond the community. I hope that this whirlwind tour of monastic history has helped you think about the multiple developmental <coughs> pathways that may be open to the communities that you study or live in, and that it has convinced you that all of us in communal studies would do well to invite more scholars of monasticism <coughs> into our conversations. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And finally, we have uh, Dr. Greg Brown, who has a doctorate in education from Indiana University with an emphasis on organizational theory. He's a retired teacher, administrator, and professor, and teaches communal history at USI's adjunct, as well as serving on the boards of the CSA, the Center for Communal Studies, and Historic New Harmony. He is also a charter member of both the CSA and the center. Can you hear me in the back? Good luck. I'm going to keep my remarks very brief on purpose today uh, because we definitely want to get to the part where we can have discussion back and forth with you. Seeing the history of communal organizations as existing along a continuum of practices that change and evolve over time has always invited me to see our study of them in the same way. This led me to use lessons from the Shakers and others when I was given the responsibility of running a unique school program. All of the students in that program had been completely excluded from normal school attendance after being labeled too violent or too impossible to teach. Using methods of attraction and commitment from communities was very helpful to these young people, and it also provided me a lab to test the efficacy of those methods in working with others. Since that work became a significant part of my doctoral thesis, Don Pitzer was able to serve on my committee at IU. Another way is that seeing our own work as developmental also empowers my continuous discussions with charter member of CSA and former executive direct, director, uh, Don Jansen. Our recent work involves moving from a binary understanding of groups as either communal or non-communal to looking at human cooperative behavior as existing along a continuum of rich and varied behaviors. This also leads to considering the beliefs and practices of groups with common property who never identify themselves as communal. Mm -hmm. For the past several years, my own work has been exploring humanity's search for meaning in the context of 21st century science and the deconstruction of many of their traditional religious beliefs. This has led me to conclude that human beings know for certain that we matter when we know we matter to each other. That leads me to con that makes bonding in groups an essential human trait, and it points toward the significance of studying human cooperative behavior beyond specific examples of communal groups to the full range of human behavior and adaptation. And with that, we want to switch over to discussion with you all.
Okay, we do have some time for question, answer, and discussion, as Greg said. Um, so the floor is yours, sir. Yeah, I have a, uh, I, I, a comment, but I'll try to make it into a question. <laughs> it seems to me that developmental community, uh, communalism is most effective in dealing with any kind of community, uh, intentional or not, because communities change and evolve. Mm. Where I see the problem is dealing with utopia. As I understand utopia, once it's established, it's perfection. And logically, yeah. perfection doesn't change. Utopians have to guard against change because change will jeopardize paradise on earth. So I see a conflict. I see it easier to apply developmental community, communalism, pardon me, as an external viewer, as a scholar, as an engineer from the outside, rather than from the inside of community, especially if you believe you have utopia. Going back to Plano's Republic, one of the first utopian statements, change was an enemy of Utopia. No. So that's my, what yeah. do you think? That's my question. <laughs> I think the, south, the saving factor is we never get there. So I think it stays developmental. I think it, that utopian ideal that you strive for empowers a progressive attitude toward your community because we're human and we never achieve Plato's utopia. So we're always on the journey. It, you go ahead. Uh, <clears throat> several weeks ago, I spoke in this very room on the quest for utopia. Uh, there was a group that came in and wanted me to speak about that. And uh, it, it really is quite a subject. Uh, it get, gets you into <clears throat> what is possible, what isn't possible, uh, how far you can go towards uh, ideals. Um, so, uh, I was happy to be able to kind of distill some of my ideas that had to do with the general quest for utopia. When I was writing on Camp Hill in the future, I found myself doing something that I thought I would never do, uh, which was to use utopia as a pejorative uh, uh, to describe exactly what you're talking about. Uh, uh, people, usually just sitting alone in a room writing, um, sometimes people trying to create something in the world with other people who imagine they have the one correct blueprint that will allow us to move out of time. Uh, I, and I don't like to use that pejoratively because the, so much of the amazing human creativity and ongoing evolution that we all study and celebrate does live in the world under the sort of label of utopia. And I don't want to attack that, uh, but to really understand what is good and exciting about the communities that I was studying and the communities that so many of us were studying, it became necessary for me to explain why they were not utopian but were involved in an ongoing back and forth with one another and with their neighbors. I just want to respond. Sure. Um, yeah, I think so often utopia does carry that pejorative sort of connotation and in sort of formulating the idea of transformative utopianism, I wanted to sidestep that <laughs> and think about the process and not the imagined perfected end product to say yes it's great to imagine an ideal state we'll, and recognize also that we'll never reach it but the point is striving for it whether we're talking about the united states of america freedom justice equality democracy those will always be aspirational or we're talking about an eco village let's yeah. live sustainably yeah. and it's always going to be aspirational and that's kind of the point uh i think larry was first I'd like to, if I had to, I'd be 
It's very directional. It has to be right in front of you. the word utopia and we don't know if it comes from the He's coming a to word you. which is a good place or the e word studies, which is no communities are a separate study from utopian studies and so i agree with a lot of what's been said i think you can add confusion there was a period of utopian socialism uh, that came over with very specific intent uh, and that Study that is a very specific yeah. set of goals. But in terms of theory, communal studies or communal studies, uh, that's really a, a, a quite a separate uh, entity from utopian studies. Doesn't mean we can't use the word utopian, although I do think that does confuse things. Hi, hi, Don. Hi, Greg. It's Tamara. Hi. So, um, I, I, I'm kind of this from a very different perspective. I just recently directed a master's thesis on ghost tourism, and they included New Harmony in that. Hmm. And one of the things that occurred to me as I was hearing you all talking about is that people who go on ghost tours or who believe in ghosts have very different perspectives, even though they're coming together to do something as a group. So my question to you is, can we even be certain that people who are coming together in a community that supposedly has a shared goal are doing that goal in the same way, or they are pursuing it for the same reasons? And so if that's not the case, if they, there is this diversity, which I'm sure there is, then can we ever expect them to achieve perfection or achieve no. their goal? <laughs> And from that point of view, we should goal. expect to see change taking place over time since the goal is really not shared. Did I stun you? No. No. 
So, so I'll, I'll, I'll jump on this um, because this does give me a bit of opportunity to talk about my own book on Camp Hill, where I am tracing uh, uh, why some Camp Hillers are following the evolving beyond community path and others are following the creative symbiosis path. And it's basically for the reason you just described, that some Camp Hillers uh, uh, see the overarching goal of Camp Hill to empower people with intellectual disabilities, and other camp pillars uh, see the overarching goal is for people of all abilities to create a more cooperative lifestyle than available in the larger society. So it's no surprise that the first group wants to evolve beyond community whenever community limits life prospects for people with disabilities, and the second group wants to engage in creative symbiosis. And the word uh, utopia itself is confusing because does it come from the Greek meaning the good place or uh, the or Greek no. meaning no place? Uh, we don't we don't know who what what he was trying to say by using the term utopia. I also would say I think there's a fundamental difference between a group that comes together for a ghost tour <laughs> and uh, eco villagers or the people in the CELA community who have spent hundreds and thousands of hours talking to each other about what their shared goals are. It doesn't mean they're all in it for the same reasons or have exactly the same motivations, but there's this deliberateness over full time, living together, being together over years. Uh, but at the same time, circumstances change, new challenges come up new leaders come in, new members come in and bring different perspectives. So yeah, the, the targets are constantly shifting and moving. Utopia appears in different forms on the horizon all the time. Great. What you bring up though, um, even when we sit together and use the same language, we are never totally sure that we mean the exact same thing. <laughs> and that's why I loved the experiment at the alternative school. Uh, we often use Owen as an example of how not to do it because he brought in all these people who did not share mm -hmm. the vision. Mm -hmm. He invited yeah. everyone on earth and then he went somewhere else. <laughs> um, so I, at that school with all expelled kids, I knew they didn't come with an expectation of a utopian school and I love the opportunity to experiment with some of the lessons we believe we have pulled out of studying mm -hmm. these groups and say, but what is possible with people who've even been ruled impossible to deal with to build yeah. a group? How, yeah. how can you help people who want, because those kids all wanted a better life. Those kids all wanted to learn. That was the central thing they all had. They just didn't think school was ever going to get it to them. So it's a beautiful place to experiment with. Can we take what we learn from studying these groups, both the good examples and the bad examples, and help people do that where they desire it? Um, well, I, uh, it has to be right in front of your mouth. Uh, yeah. Well, that didn't um, So, uh, yeah, the, this idea of a uh, common uh, collective motivation through uh, commonly held belief. John Humphrey always called that uh, afflatus. Um, mm -hmm. And it seems to me that, that in order to have a communal project, there does have to be a common belief in communitarianism, in, in community. Um, and John Humphrey always said the best source for that was religion. Um, and so I, he did see, I think, the Raphites as a success and the Owenites as a failure. And that was his reasoning was that uh, the Owenites did work, work united. And so they didn't have the, the sufficient afflatus. Um, but the, uh, Dr. Pitzer, your, your theory of developmental communalism talks about how those common beliefs need to be adaptable and change. So, is there a balance between a cohesiveness of belief, but also uh, an ability to adapt and change? Hmm. Maybe that is utopia. <laughs> <laughs> Tell him. Maybe that is utopia. 
<laughs> the balance. The balance. The balance. <laughs> I feel like, if I may, uh, I mean, I think, and I think this is part of Don's point. The belief doesn't have to be in communitarianism itself to bring people together, right? The belief might be something else. And communitarianism is a tool for reaching for it, right? Whether or not that is the ideal yeah, belief, method. being together, cooperating, sharing. It might just be a tool for getting there. In, in other cases, that is a core part of the belief. Yeah, Jean Vanier, you know, famously said that the belief should not be about communalism, that that will always fail. And Twin Oaks would be one example uh, of how that's wrong. Sometimes that works. Uh, I, I do think in the aggregate, uh, uh, most, long, long, most long lasting communities do have some non communal dimensions to their afflatus, for sure. Hey, uh... Oh. <laughs> um, so I wanted to ask a question. All, all of the examples uh, and empirical data that you've given thus far seems to come from European or European mm. groups. Uh, I mean, Dan, you talked a little bit about early Islam, but not inherently in the communal sense. You talk about the limits of generalizability in yeah. this way, um, especially in you know Eastern, non-European, any any context outside of white people. First, I'll tell you that my graduate training and research was with Dr. Guba at Indiana University, who totally rejected the idea of generalizability at all, and said that what we always do is provide the richest description we can of what we're studying so that other people may examine it and say, does that have anything to me? Uh, he rejected the claims of statistical research that you could prove something would work in more than one place. But what you mentioned is a hole in what we've done so far that I'm really looking forward to. Uh, just beginning into these areas of studying black community and post-slavery black communities in the United States, I think we might label a lot of those unintentional communities. And there's a great deal to study there about where are the commonalities, where are the differences uh, because they come together for very different reasons and to survive and to have safety. But I think it would be very interesting as we study more of those to say, what are the differences and what are the commonalities? Yeah, I, I do believe that Buddhist monasticism is probably as strong a case of creative symbiosis as Christian monasticism. I don't know enough to sort of flesh that out in detail. I also think that most of the communities that most of us study understand themselves in relation to larger societies that might be categorized as imperial or capitalist. Uh, and there's an interesting distinction between uh, oppositional groups that emerge from the dominant group within an imperial or capitalist society and oppositional groups or alternative groups uh, that emerge from uh, subaltern or, or marginalized uh, subgroups within those societies. Um, but those cases would be quite different from dynamics of community uh, um, in among people in places that are not deeply shaped by imperialism or capitalism. And I would say that, I mean, in today's world, contemporary world, all corners of it have been touched by <laughs> yes. individualist capitalist mm -hmm. colonization. And I think of a chapter in uh, my book, Environmental Anthropology, Engaging e Ecotopia, where Brian Burke and Beatriz Arjona talk about two different communities in Ecuador, uh, one of quite wealthy people that wanted to live more sustainably and organize themselves communally to do that, and another group of poor indigenous women that found mm -hmm. themselves in dire circumstances and organized communally in response to that. It's in the context of this larger world system.
But I think we could go back and go to other parts of the world and look at the rise of early states and yeah. uh, the way that they oppressed folks and find groups of people in many corners of the world that organize themselves cooperatively in response to that to resist sort of the colonization of the states. Josh, in the scholarship on eco-villages, how much conversation is there between uh, eco-villages like Dancing Rabbit um, that are composed of uh, people emerging from professional class communities and eco-villages like many of the eco-villages in Haiti or in Africa that are a particular strategy uh, um, of engagement with sustainable technologies by traditional uh, villages and colonized societies? I mean, I think it's more in Global Eco-Village Network. Europe has been doing this more. I think of Jonathan Dawson going to, say, Senegal and... Yeah talking about that a lot, although Zach will be familiar with this one too. I mean, Dancing Rabbit folks are in conversation with the, um, yeah, I'm not even gonna try and pronounce the name. Oh yeah. What's the, the tribal group, Muscogee people in Alabama who are trying to sort of revitalize their culture, go back to their homeland and are using tools from Dancing Rabbit to yeah. help them do that, not that they're trying to recreate Dancing Rabbit. So I, does that answer your question? Yeah. Real quickly, I also think of one of the statues in my office that is an Ubuntu carving from Africa where a circle of people are all, all carved out of one piece of wood mm -hmm. interlocking. And there are at least some cultures in Africa where the idea that because you are, I exist, they might ask us what in the world we're talking about. This is what human beings do. Yeah. <laughs> I have two different questions. One is, is there a study about people that have just given up on society, like there's been monks, or not monks, um, perverts? Mm -hmm. And the other is, you know, all of this discussion is about um, smaller groups. What happens when it gets on a large scale? What about communism? Yeah. Well, I think Sylvia Road is, uh, Sylvia, are you here? Yes, she's um, there in the back. <laughs> I, I think some of your work is speaking to the second half of that, though. How do, how do you think about strategy in communism compared to in the kinds of communities we study here? Oh, oh so the question was, the, the first part of the question was about hermits, but the second part of the question was about how communal studies should be in dialogue with the study of communism. And I thought you might have something to say on that. It's just not that in my area. No. Oh. But it's definitely looking at, um, at the Soviets and the, the Cold War, or during the Cold War, of having a living community as a more community of convenience, being a part of that communal living in, in the Soviet Yeah. Mm. It's it's an important contrast. We we had a speaker at one of the early conferences who was a professor from China, and she gave quite vivid examples of how Mao's rhetoric about returning the elite to the commune to stay in touch with the people and the in the context of Chinese communism was actually a cover for re-education and fairly brutal treatment and didn't involve people in becoming part of the commune at all. This topic I like when I try and get people to discuss and think more deeply about this idea that all communal groups are somehow isolationist. These groups we study in the United States tend to be very successful financially and it's not because that would work for the whole country to do the exact same thing. It's because when they share capital, they have capital and they can be very successful in the middle of a capitalist society. Though by practicing a, a different type 
of life, they're very successful within our society. And it would be a whole nother matter to say somebody can organize the entire country to do exactly what they do as a large group. Now, how many small groups could we have? You know, how do you have enough small groups for people to be who they are, still have their full range of individual life choices like Dan talks about? That's a different issue than doing what Russia or China have done. The question of hermits and people who have sort of given up on society is an interesting one. I feel like in all the time I've spent in communities, there's an element of that. There are some members who find themselves in community because they did sort of reject society and they're not there because they necessarily want to be with other like-minded people, but because this is a place where they can sort of separate themselves from the larger scale society and here's a context where they can still get by i'd be a fascinating to dig a little deeper on that it's not something i've really thought about before but i sort of recognized that when i thought about the people i know in community yeah, yeah i mean this is something that catholic monasticism has institutionalized uh um, that there are certain orders that are basically designed to foster a mostly eremitical or hermits uh, lifestyle, mm -hmm. uh, in that they only come together, you know, you know, once a week or something, and otherwise stay in their cells. But even in Benedictine communities that are really mostly about everybody being together, uh, it's possible for individual members uh, to say, "I'd like to be a hermit for a year," and the community will facilitate that and give them the level of connection that's right for them while allowing them to pursue that kind of path of prayer. And actually at Camp Hill Village, Minnesota, when I was spending time there, uh, there was a fellow, he was himself a Catholic monastic who uh, was the last, he was the last lay brother in his order. Uh, uh, and so he came to Camp Hill and worked out a deal where he wouldn't live in a household. He lived in a trailer next to the chicken coop and he managed the chickens, uh, the, the community's chickens and um, drove the, the Roman Catholic members of the community to mass on Sundays, but otherwise lived his own, his own prayerful life. Coffee is waiting, but we have time for one more question. Uh, hi, uh, so uh, I'm relatively new here, but I definitely would uh, go to an old conversation. Uh, invite us to keep the term utopian. I think, mm -hmm. you know, it's contested exactly because it is so powerful. Um, mm -hmm. Kind of getting rid of it would be like kind of into psychologists saying we shouldn't talk about love or something. Um, <laughs> I do also have a question. Uh, I, <laughs> uh, I was curious to know. You know, you were talking about transitions within communal societies, and I was curious to know if um, how it's been studied within the context of changing socioeconomic conditions and how that kind of changes people moving in or out or the growth or uh, decline of these communities. And I'm thinking particularly about, like, say, marinage communities that uh, existed in mm. the context of escaped slavery or yeah. other kinds of uh, societies like that. Did you hear him? I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. I was looking at my paper. Sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, I feel like I could use a restatement of your question myself. Uh, yeah, so I was just, uh, I was curious to know how changing socioeconomic conditions may uh, affect the kind of growth and decline of communities. Uh, you know, you're talking about with, uh, I forget the word, the lids, uh, where the kind of monasteries be moving into a place where there's less people who are living at full time and more people kind of maybe coming because they want a taste of it or coming as tourists or something like that. But it's, I wonder to what extent these kinds of things are influenced by the larger trends in, in overall society, like say declining income, increasing inequality, or changing cultural values, things like that. If that's, if that's been a topic of study. There, there are a lot of people here 
during the times between sessions <laughs> that you can talk with about the specific groups they study and exactly how that is part of the transition. I think it's also part of the transition that's going on now where we're getting more and more co-housing in those types of communities. Uh, that may be an avoidance of the deep commitment. A lot of it is the socioeconomic status of the United States right now, that people are looking for ways to live. But there are a lot of people here who can share with you examples of the specific communities they study. There's a book that argues that there's an upswing of communalism at times of economic downturn. And I think a lot of folks in this association have found faults in that book. I think it's an argument worth exploring more. I think there's also an argument to be made that it's people who have privilege and the economic freedom to choose community. And when that is more abundant, you find more community. I, I don't know of a definitive analysis of that, though. Yeah, I think the big historical case study of that would be the Fourierist boom of the 1840s, which definitely came in the wake of uh, a major depression and faded as the economy rebounded. But it's hard to see that that pattern plays out in, in other cases. We have a member uh, <clears throat> who lives in uh, California, Don Jansen, and he studies uh, intentional communities, sometimes just called ICs, and uh, probably should put you in touch with him because uh, he really has some, some nice findings that have to do with these mm -hmm. multiplying uh, intentional communities. I can give you his uh, email address. Well, with that, thank you all so much for coming. I want to thank our four panelists and also. <laughs>